Sing me a song of a last that is gone. Say, could that last be I? Then we get to episode eight. We are back in Lillibrock in Scotland because Claire and Jamie, they decided that too much heartbreak has happened in Paris and they, they need to feel like they are home again. Uh, some time has passed since Paris, at least I assume, because they seem quite happy. They don't walk around being all sad all the time. They still are, of course, but time heals wounds and it seems like this wound has more or less healed by this, this point in time. Uh, uh, they then receive a letter with a list of names and Jamie Jamie's name is on this list, and it's a list of traitors, basically. This comes as a surprise for them, because Jamie has never signed anything like this with his name, which means someone, namely Charles Stewart, has forged his signature and, forced, and is forcing him to get involved with the war. They then decide to go to Jamie's grandfather because Jamie can't really get out of the situation now and they need more men for the war. And the grandfather got those, he has those men. Here we get reunited with none other than Colin McKenzie, Jamie's oldest uh, uncle, who has also brought Leary with him as his mate. We all remember Leary, and so does Claire, obviously. So she confronts her about what happened at, at uh, Cringemere, you know, the witch trial. And Leary is all teary and says she's sorry, but Claire is basically, fuck off. <laughs> uh, I don't hate you, but I do pity you for wanting something you can never have, but I can't help you with getting things right with God. Which is more or less a condemnation to hell back then. So I just love Claire so much. She's so she's awesome. But not much else happens in this episode. It's mostly a bunch of old men arguing and talking. It's just a little bit boring to me, honestly. This episode ends with Claire pretend pretending to have a vision so that the grandfather will give the requirement for the war, which works because he is very superstitious and that is a pretty awesome thing scene i think but other than that it is so boring and that is why i am going to put it in the f section episode nine now this is where we we really get to feel that there is a war going on we get to see soldiers making campsites and start training. Uh, and in this episode, we get to see uh, Claire experiencing, experiencing PTSD from uh, World, World War II. It's very interesting to see this, uh, but I also get a bit frustrated, honestly, because I don't understand why she keeps her thoughts and feelings from Jamie. She keeps insisting that she's fine, don't worry, I'm all right. I don't understand why she feels like she has to keep her trauma to herself and not go to Jamie about it. Please, if anyone knows or understands this, please let, let me know in the comments. I understand that this is, of course, a very real and serious thing for a lot of people and someone who has experienced trauma might not understand Claire here better than I do. But as someone who has, hasn't tried anything that resulted in trauma, I don't understand why she wouldn't go to Jamie, the one person in the world she absolute trusts with this issue of hers. Again, if you know, then please enlighten me in the comments. I do like the storyline though, uh, as I said before, it's interesting to see that part of, of uh, Claire's life as well. We then get to 
meet Lord John Gray for the first time. He is of course played by a different actor in the later seasons, but it is indeed a 16 year old John himself. That plays out is one of my favorite uh, comedy scenes, if you can call it that. Uh, it is the one where Claire pretends to be a hostage of the Scottish army and she and Jamie act out this scene in front of John but Jamie is pretending to assault Claire and I just love how she actually fights back with kicking him and then him kissing her where she has to pretend she doesn't want it when she actually really does and the facial expressions they give to each other they are just they're basically just turning each other on here and it is so, it is so hot to actually watch I'm like well damn I want that too. <laughs> um, it's just a great scene and poor John, he eats it all up uh, and gives away the location of the English army in order to try and save Claire. But don't worry, don't worry John, it's just for playing. <laughs> I love this scene. Um, I think it's a very good episode and that is why I will put it in the G section. Episode 10 gets that just that just gets straight into the the A section. It is not as great as the Faith episode, but this episode is just I don't have words. In here we get our first big battle. And in this battle, we unfortunately lose a beloved character, Angus. R.I.P. my man. We will miss him and he was a great comedic relief character. It's just a very well done episode. I love the scene where Claire and Jamie say goodbye before he goes to battle. The battle itself is very well choreographed and shot. And following some of the uh, and following some of the battle from the women's slash nurses perspective, and seeing young Fergus regretting his choice to join the battle is just so heartbreaking, and there's just so much to enjoy in this episode. So yeah, that is why it is a for amazing. And in episode eleven. We start the episode out with seeing a group of Scots on their way to somewhere <laughs> uh, before they get am ambushed by English, English uh, soldiers. Claire, Jamie, Rupert, Dougal, Fergus, Myrta Mert and a bunch of other in the group they were with, uh, they, they run away, of course, <laughs> and then they end up at a church. And here they hide for some time while attending wounds and figuring out what to do. The plan they come up with is uh, in order not to get burned alive <laughs> inside the church, uh, Claire has to pretend to be a hostage again <laughs> and that they will deliver her to the English soldier in exchange for them to go free. Yeah, so now we follow Claire, as she is taking somewhere else than expected, and we get to meet Hugh Monroe again, uh, the, the beggar from season one. Uh, Claire is using her clever tricks and gets a message through Monroe where she is actually being taken to. And this place is the house of, of a man we all know too well, the Duke of Sandringham. So now Claire is stuck at the house with a traitor who is setting up a trap for when Jamie comes for Claire. Brilliant. This is a brilliant situation. Um, and Mary Hawkins is uh, there is there too. And we find out that she is actually the Duke's uh, goddaughter. The Duke's plan to trap Jamie, it obviously fails. And after a very tense scene between Claire and the Duke in the kitchen, Jamie and Myrta burst in. We learn here that it was the 
Duke, who was behind the attack in Paris on Claire Mary, and that his manservant was the one who violated Mary. We get two awesome moments in a row here. I mean, Outlander is spoiling us, <laughs> spoiling me at this point. Uh, first, a girl power moment from Mary, where she takes matters into her own hands and stabs the servant in the stomach. Yes, girl! We don't need, need men to... Re okay, well, it's nice to have men re take revenge on our behalf, but it's so satisfying to do it ourselves. <laughs> um, and then Murtag gets to fulfill his promise of revenge on their behalf. He, in the most awesome way ever, cuts the head off the Duke, lays the head at the feet of Claire and Mary, and says, I lay your vengeance at your feet. Oh, it is so cool, and Murta is a legend. Yes, I love this scene. This episode, despite the awesome last scene, gets into the G section. It is not strong enough to be extremely good, but with the great scene at the end, it is much better than forgettable. We're down to the last two guys. So episode 12. I feel like this is a very slow episode because it is not the most action-packed episode. Callum, who is very seriously dying in this episode, I mean, he's been dying ever since we met him, but now it's, it's close. He has arrived and takes a room in a boarding house close to the camp. And he is there to, sell, to uh, settle what exactly will happen to the clan and who will take leadership after he dies. He decides, actually, to give the position of uh, acting clan leader to Jamie and charges him with the upbringing of his son and to help him become a good leader for the clan. When he tells this to Dougal, he's not happy about it. Uh, but that is his decision, which in my opinion is, of course, the right decision. <laughs> Can you imagine Dugu as leader? No, no. Mm. Uh, later in the episode, after a speech from Dugu telling Colm how he has felt being his little brother the entire lives and how he has always been jealous of him, Colm then dies. Another storyline we follow in this episode is Alex Randall, who is also dying uh, in another boarding house in the town. And in this storyline, we find out that Mary is pregnant with Alex's child, not Jack's. And that it is actually Alex Randall that is Frank's direct ancestor. Again, not Jack. Thank God. <laughs> A uh, huge relief, if you ask me. But that doesn't change the fact that Alex is still dying. And he wants Jack to marry Mary. So that they will get taken care of after he dies and, and give the baby the Randall name. Claire actually encourages this because she knows that Jack will die in three days at the Battle of Culloden. And thus even though neither of them wants to. Mary and Jack get married and minutes later Alex dies. Even though these two storylines are important to the overall story and also at times emotional, I can't help but feel like there didn't need to be an entire episode dedicated to these two men dying. I don't know, I just feel like the storylines could have been resolved in a few scenes instead of an entire episode and we could still have gotten the same amount of information out of it. As for where to put it, I am on the very line between G and F. If I could, I would put it on the line, 
But since I have to choose, I think that uh, I will have to put it at the very front of it. It is, of course, not completely forgettable at all, I think. But I just, I miss some action. Uh, and I feel like this is more of a filler episode than an actually important one. The last episode, episode 13. We start out the episode in 1968, meeting Brianna and a grown-up Roger for the first time. Uh, we get told here that Claire and Brianna are in Scotland to pay their respect to a recently deceased Reverend Wakefield, whom we might remember from season one. Uh, Roger insists that they stay on for a couple of days, and so the search begins. Frank is dead by this point in time, and so it's only Brianna and Claire who are in Scotland. Uh, what Claire is uh, spending her time on is going to places that used to mean something for him, Jamie, such as a closed up Lally Brock, and also finding the deed that says that young, young Jamie is the new laird of Lally Brock. Roger and Brianna they start looking into old documents of the Reverend, and they mention the Randall uh, ancestors, and so they start digging deeper and deeper until they find old new newspaper uh, articles and letters between the Reverend and Frank that says that Claire disappeared for three years and came back pregnant. It of course doesn't take long for Guiana to figure out that Frank isn't her biological father. She of course confronts Claire about this, and Claire she tells her the truth uh, about Jamie for the 